Hi, right, hopefully you can all see that. So um, I'm Adrian Moxworthy, and with my PhD student, Evie Baker, we've been looking at the revisiting the non-heating prize at pillar intensity method uh, using a remnants-based fork diagrams. Um, so as we just heard you know, pillar, about pillar intensity determination, there's a whole bunch of different methods for getting pillar intensity determination. Obviously, the, there's the, the classic tele, type and then there's a whole range of other ones there's the heating ones like there's the Shaw, wilson multi-specimen plus a whole range of other ones and then for some materials it's not possible to heat them because they chemically alter or you're just not allowed to heat them because because whoever owns the sample says you're not allowed to heat it so these are typically for meteoritic samples but also other types of material which do not like being heated so there's a whole range of non-heating approaches for determining absolute pillow intensity there's the rem family of, of um, methods, there's a microwave method which has been pioneered by Liverpool, there's a pseudo tele ARM method, uh, and there's other ones, but the, the, the one we're interested in is, or I'm interested in, I should say, is the prize it method. Now, I, with colleagues, I introduced this method, um, developed this method about 10 years ago, and, um, and well, it hasn't been widely used, as we saw in the, in the previous talk, it was very, the very very bottom of the, the pint um, database. So it's obviously not the, the most popular method. So I just thought I'd start off by running through the sort of basic idea of how this um, method works just very quickly before we look at the different types of uh, fork measurements. So this is all sort of based around price theory. And it's very, for people looking at fork diagrams, this sort of figure should be quite familiar in the sense that you have a, a region where you have a distribution, and I just noticed I've misspelled remnants, but that's just a, a minor detail. And um, you can, uh, depending on the position within this private space, you can make a prediction of how an individual particle um, or a histeron or a grain or particle will, will respond uh, to variations in things like temperature and time. And so how do we do that? We have, the, we have this, this space here, and if we allow for a randomly orientated particle, um, single domain particle, I should add, we can uh, estimate um, uh, this critical activation barrier. So what are these curves? Well, essentially, depending on where the, the particle lies within this plane, it can be super paramagnetic, it can either be field blocked or positive or negative. Or importantly, it can be uh, the remnants blocked in this region. This is what the area of the most interesting, this is where you acquire the TRM. And so essentially what we do is, well, sorry, we can also, we can also vary the fields. If we apply a small field, these shifts, these barriers uh, slightly up the screen. And so we, what we do is we have a um, prize distribution, which is essentially a, a fork. We, we measure a fork distribution and we turn it, make it symmetrical. And then we use that as our prize distribution. So essentially we're using the fork measurements, which many of you are familiar with as our input into this um, series of measurements. And so what we do is, we, 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 what we want to do is, rather than measure the sample at high temperature, what we want to do is simulate that in our model. So we do all the measurements at room temperature and then we make a prediction using Price's theory of how a particular sample would respond, would require a TRM and how it respond at high temperature. So this is just a simulation of what actually happens inside the model. It's just a schematic of what happens inside the model. So at very high temperature with the Curie temperature, you have these abstract curves, but you have no um, uh, price distribution. As you cool the temperature down within our model, the fork distribution or the price distribution grows out from the origin and expands, whilst at the same time, these curves uh, shrink towards the origin. And as the distribution crosses over these curves, this is the point where the <clears throat> we take a track of it by distribution and we keep a record of how things are blocked, at what temperature they're blocked, and, and we add everything up and we get the condensation. So let's go down to low temperature. You can see the curves have shrunk a bit and the, the, the price distribution has expanded. Then we switch the field off and this gives us our simulated TRM. Okay, so I developed this technique about with colleagues about 11, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And we were using infield standard fork measurements. So we're using an infield measurement to produce a fork measure, fork distribution or price distribution to look at a remnants, to look at paleo intensity, which is essentially a remnants based effect. Now, more or less independently, the two groups, one in Norway and one in ANU in Australia, developed um, remnants based fork, based fork diagrams. Um, both had slightly different methods, but you can see on the, 
On the left here, they had the standard fault measurement. On the right, they have their version of the remnants fault measurement. This area here is the, the remnants region. So in the particular um, Nate Church and in, in the group of Norway only plot this region, the ANU group, they, they managed to calculate uh, what they call a remnants fork in all, the, all of the area here. Now we were kind of interested in that. So we started them um, doing some measurements and particularly interested in the, the rem fork approach because it's quite easy to, to accessible to implement. So we started doing some measurements along there. But however, I became a little bit unhappy with the, the measurement protocol they were using. Uh, so we developed our own. So maybe I just explain why I was not particularly happy with their measurement protocol. So here is the measurement protocol as shown in their paper, in Shao's paper from 2017. Now this might seem a little bit confusing. So I thought I would try and explain this with a little series of um, cartoons on the right. So this is a standard fork measurement. We measure at the peak, we come back and then we don't measure this section here. And then we measure a single fork. That's a fork and we measure a hundred of those or so and then we construct a fork diagram. So what the ANU group did was to they would take a measurement here and then to get the remnants fork, they would then go to the origin. So this is this bit here on this side of the curve. Um, and then they go back again to measure that side and then they go back to the origin. And then the other side, they do the same thing. So they're doing this backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. So the, the whole thing about fork diagrams is after every measurement, you saturate the sample after every fork and you clean out the entire history. Whereas in this particular protocol, the, the measurement you're going to met, um, determine is a, is a function of the protocol that you've actually used. So it's, there's a, all the history is getting mixed up all together. And I didn't particularly like that. So we thought of a, a simpler approach. So essentially, this is a new, so we, we don't measure on this side, we only measure on this side of the, of, the, of the fork. And then we come back to the origin, that's exactly the same as what the ANU group did. But then rather than just go back to this point, we go back to the maximum all the way around and then back to here, sorry, I've skipped back to here and then go back to the origin. So essentially we wipe out every single point is a clean point. We wipe out all the history at every single point. So we, we've done that. We've, we've written our own software to do that. And um, we, we started to measure that on a bunch of our samples. So just to show you initially what they look like, this is our new protocol. This is using uh, Richard Harrison's Fork and Hell program, plotting. And you can see we've, we've only, we only calculate inside the remnants region. Um, uh, the ANU group calc plot in the whole region, but you can see these are the figures plotted in the same software. Um, I perhaps should have made this one here on the right a little bit smaller for direct comparison, but you can see they're very similar. I mean, one would expect them to be roughly similar. One would expect not too big a difference, but anyway, we, we think ours is sort of theoretically a, a better type of measurement. Anyway, so we measured this for a bunch of historical samples that we already had in the laboratory. So here we have the in-field measurement for a particular sample where we rotated the fault diagrams into the same orientation. And we have the remnants type fault diagram. One thing you'll notice straight away is that they're slightly more symmetrical. Um, and here's another sample. So we measured a whole bunch of, of, of different samples. And I should, as you'll see later, there's a working process. We haven't finished measuring all these samples. And um, then what we did was we, we calculated the paleo intensity using the same protocol as Prizic protocol, but so all we've done is change the input. That's all we've really done. And um, so what we have on this graph, we have the remnants Prizic, this is the new data, new method, or the new input method on, on, on the vertical, we divided by the known fields. These are all from historical lavas. We know the answer, so we expect the answer to be one. Okay, so anything above one is rubbish. Anything, these numbers are clearly rubbish. And then we've got the infield, this is the old, calculations we did for the 2011s, we plotted them against each other. So initially there's some, you'd expect, ideally you'd want everything to be plotting here at one, just about here, but clearly they're not, right? Um, however, subsequent to the 2011 paper, we have introduced some selection protocols which weren't in the initial method. And these are actually buried away in an appendix of a paper I published with Anita. And, um, what we do is we look at the simulated and measured um, AF demagnetization spectra, and depending on the misfit, we either accept, or as in this case, or reject, as in the case at the bottom. Now, these 
this method was de designed for a completely different set of samples, but when we apply it to our new data set, that this, you can see that it just rejects all of these points, which is great because you know, that was just what we were hoping to see and it's actually what happened. So we've actually now got rid of a lot of these very bad data points. We're just left with the data around about here is what we'd hope for. So just to sort of finish off we, in the last couple of slides, we, um, we took uh, paleo intensity estimates for, for, um, for a series of uh, larva units, historical larva units. So here we've got three here, and these are the known field. These are the field at the time of eruption. These are all in the last 100 years. Uh, and we only chose larva units where we had at least three successful estimates. We do actually have more samples than this, but we only had maybe one or two estimates. So I'm just rejecting those. At this stage, it's still a work in progress. We're gonna be measuring more samples. So let's just have a look at what we've got here. We've got the, the three locations. We have um, Paracotines in Mexico, Hetero's in Iceland, and Vesuvius is in Italy, probably the most famous of those three volcanoes. We have the known fields. We have the new data here. I've highlighted it in, in gray. It's the number of samples that we measured. So this is the number that we measured versus the successful ones versus the total measure. So 100% success for here, not so successful for paracotene. And this is the remnants uh, input for the remnants fault diagrams at input. You can see the answers here. We've got 51 and expecting 52, 38 and 44 and 45 and 41. If we compare it to the infield measurements that we measured before, um, you can see that the estimates here are much closer to the known answers than the infield Prysic approaches. Now, clearly these are much bigger studies. We've got far more samples here, okay? So, you know, these are much bigger studies, but you can see that the, these are the answers here that we've determined with the new protocol are much closer. Um, then we're gonna look at another non-heating protocol, the REM prime one, which is probably the most standard or famous or the most utilized of the non-heating protocols. This is the REM prime. So some new data, unpublished data here, but this, so the, but this old data has been published all before. Now you can see the estimates here are really close to the, to the known field. And um, in the case of Vesuvius, um, Heckler, the Prysic approach seems to be slightly better. For Paracotine, the REM prime method is pretty rubbish. It gives an estimate that's um, four times or three, three, and a, three and a bit times higher. Um, the, the main reason for this is probably because there's no rejection criteria in the REM prime. So it doesn't, there's no way of saying a good point, good or bad data point other than the answer is you don't like the answer. So this is one of the reasons why the, the REM prime is, is quite high. Now, obviously the gold standard for paleo intensity is still the tele method. Um, and uh, so looking back at our published data, we don't have any for this particular larva unit in, in Iceland, but we do have some data from Vesuvius and Paracotene. And you can see these are quite big studies. We do have rather a, a large number of uh, determinations per unit, uh, but we get answers here, which are very, very, very large errors on, but they're, they're very, these are one standard deviations, I should add, um, they're, they're quite close to the known uh, field, but you know, so looking at this, we can conclude that the, compared to non-heating techniques, this new uh, approach for the remnants Prysic, um, uh, well, remnants fork input data in the Prysic approach is an improvement on the infield fork diagrams, probably better than the REM prime uh, methods, and it's getting comparable to the Tellier type estimates, I would argue. So just to conclude with that, we, I think our new remnants fort measurement is, is, is theoretically an improvement on both those of, of Nate Church and Xiang. Um, the remnants fort method seems to be, give a better estimates using the prize at Pillion Tense than the infield approach. And we hope to make a publication at some point in the next year, if we ever get time to write a paper, and um, we'll be producing the Python code. So we obviously to do these measurements. We, we, we generate, use Jupyter script to write the code, which you then put into the software on the um, Princeton VSM that we have. And then you need obviously a little bit, some software to, to fix that and, and make it um, do the fork processing. But that's something that we can 
you know, we plan to publish as a Python script. Okay, thank you for listening. So thank you, Adrian. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, I've got a question, Tobias, if that's okay. Yep, yep. <clears throat> Hi, Adrian. Um, very nice Hi. talk, very compelling results. Um, so forgive my ignorance on this. It's the function of not having easy access to anything that measures forks at Liverpool. Um, but is this method, can you get rid of large overprints with AFD magnetization or something? Is it is it then applicable to you know more ancient samples that have got significant secondary magnetizations? Well, yes. So we do we do only. So obviously we, we measure the AFD magnetization spectra, but we only we only select for the pillar intensity determination the, the, the section of the AFD mag spectra where we think there's a primary remnant. And obviously it's up to you to define what the primary remnant is, but you know, normally if it's a kink in the Zydafel plot, then one would assume that that's the, the point of where the you know the other print is. And so yes, you can do that. So, I mean, you could remove like 50% of the of the remnant, say, with an AFD bag and then just focusing on that high coercivity section. Yeah, so I didn't actually show that. We did actually have, those are all, all the samples I showed there are, his, you know, historical samples. So there's a, if there is an overprint there, it's reduced, removed in the first, you know, 5, 10, 15 millitesla. Um, and I didn't explain it, but there was a green line there showing showing where we, you know, you know said that all the points must be above the selected points must be above that that green line. Um, yeah, so so okay. we do do that. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So we have time for another question. If anyone, yeah, Richard. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so the the four the samples you showed the fork diagrams of were all you know, pretty pretty convincing single domain type forks with relatively narrow not central ridges as such but they were they were you know single domain uh, so the ones that work well are they are they all of that type fork or or have you got equally good data on sort of more um non sd type forks um, that's a good question. Um, well, to be honest, we've been focusing on the historical lavas that we had in the laboratory already. Um, we weren't really picking them based on their domain state. We we're just picking them because we had all the other information for those samples and we knew the answer. Um, so, no, we've not rigorously explored other types of domain state. We just stuck to what we already got in our collection. But I agree that is something we'd, we'd like to do. And I, you know, I thought we'd measured enough samples, but when I started preparing this talk, I realized that we probably need to measure another 20 or 30 samples. And I should, I didn't mention this, but the measurement protocol, as you probably familiar, probably can tell already, is not particularly quick. It takes about 14 hours to measure a sample, which is just a little bit too long to measure two a day. So we're just measuring one overnight typically and then using the instrument for something else. In the rest of the day. So it does mean it's quite a slow process collecting the data. Uh, but yeah, we do need to investigate um, other samples. Might be worth synthesizing some. I do have some synthetic multi domain samples, which I could, we could look at as well. Yeah. Um, and with your new protocol, presumably you don't get the I fork and T fork from that data, or do you? No, we don't okay. have that information. Yeah. So, it's, that's just, so it's designed purely for the to get the REM fork. Yeah, I guess in that point, it, I do, it's more like Nate Church's method, but we do it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Without without the log, it, does it have a, a, a constant grid set spacing? Um, yes, we do that. It doesn't have to have that. We could change that, but the way it's set up now, it's constant spacing. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I personally, I prefer constant spacing. But <laughs> well, I just, yeah, I just think it's much easier to, well, especially from a, 
also I've already got a program that works with constant spacing, doesn't work with <laughs> constant spacing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very good.